In the first part of our journey through Java, we visited lots of extraordinary places. Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia. The melting pot of all Indonesian peoples and cultures. The political as well as the economic center, a mega city of extremes. The pleasant town of Bogor, which seems almost Mediterranean, with the botanical garden, and the early Dutch summer residences. Bandung perches on a plateau over 700 meters high. The city gained its wealth through tea and coffee cultivation. The tea factory Kiata, which was built amid tea fields under the volcanoes. The hot springs of Marebaya, which on weekends are a popular destination for the people of Bandung. By raft to the traditional village of Kampung Pulo, with a temple and a unique cemetery. Inhabitants of the Sundanese farming village Kampung Naga have been able to preserve their traditional way of life. The fishing village of Pangandaran on the south coast is considered a beach paradise. And in the nearby nature reserve, deer live between caves and ancient tombs. The volcanic Desa Dieng Plateau at an altitude of more than 2,000 meters has for years been considered the sacred seat of the gods. And the Borobudur Temple, the culmination of the Golden Age the largest Buddhist monument in the world, heritage of humanity. The city of Yogyakarta and its province have been governed by a sultan since pre-colonial times and enjoy special region status. Fort and Museum Vredeburg is known as a striking building of the Dutch colonial era. The Sultan approved its construction in 1765. Jalan Malioboro is the most famous street and has existed since the city was founded, with shops, colonial houses and horse-drawn carriages waiting for customers. The Sonobudio Museum is considered the city's most important museum, with an unparalleled collection of Javanese cultural goods. The carefully curated exhibitions give a fascinating insight into the history, culture and religion of Java. It is interesting that both the commissioners and architects were Dutch. The bird market has not lost its appeal. Songbirds have for a long time been considered a status symbol in Indonesian society. Taman Sari, the water castle, was the Sultan and his court's summer residence. What must the fragrant, beautiful garden once have looked like with its sparkling ponds and bubbling springs? A place of rest, but also for the Sultan to receive visitors on a gigantic scale and with refined splendor. This magnificent complex consisted of more than 50 buildings, including cool living rooms and smartly designed bathrooms. The Sultan and his court ladies rested and recovered here, 
and visiting still gives a glimpse into the golden times. The Sultan's Palace, also called Kraton, is the spiritual and political heart of the city. The palace complex built in 1755 under Sultan Haming Kubuono I is still characterized today by its splendor and pragmatism. The gilded columns and ceilings of the open pavilions give a clue to the incredible wealth of the time. Garments and works of art are exhibited in various showrooms. A particular highlight is the throne of the last sultan. On Sundays, classical court dances are also performed in the palace. Culturally, the city is considered the cradle of Javanese culture. It takes great artistic skill to design figures cut out of thin buffalo skin decorate them and finally to paint them. The Dalang moves the figures in front of a white canvas illuminated by an oil lamp and the Gamelan Orchestra plays along. Wayang Kulit is the oldest form of traditional Indonesian theater and has been documented as early as the 10th century. Shadow play is part of ancient Javanese ancestral culture as they believe that the souls of the dead appear as shadows. The Dalang is the choreographer, actor, writer and narrator in one person. The characters are introduced in the first act. In the second, the hero contemplates his message and in the third act, the great battle begins that ends with the victory of order and balance. These are usually prodigious heroic stories in which God always grants Krishna moral support in the fight against his relatives. Attending a screening of the Ramayana Ballet is usually accompanied by a lavish evening buffet before the performance. After the traditional attunement, the story of Rama and the battle between the gods and the demons is performed, the never-ending fight between good and evil. The performers provide a fascinating performance, complete with elegant movements and opulent costumes, and always accompanied by the atmospheric music of a gamelan orchestra. Rama, the great hero, defeats his opponents at archery and claims Sita, the daughter of a king, as his wife. In a coup, 
Rama's brother takes the throne, and Rama has to flee with Sita into the mystical forest. From there, the demon king Ravana abducts Sita and takes her to his kingdom. Rama searches for her with the help of the wise monkey Hanuman, who finds and frees Sita with the monkey army. Sita now has to pass a trial by fire to prove her virginity is untouched. She passes this, and yet Rama still banishes her and becomes an ascetic ascending into the heavens as Vishnu. The temples of Prambanan are located close to the city of Yogyakarta. This area was once home to a powerful and prosperous dynasty. The largest Hindu temple complex in central Java, built in honour of the god Shiva, dates back to the 9th century. This stone symbol demonstrates the victory of the Mataram dynasty over the Buddhist Shailendra. The exterior walls of the smaller shrines on the demarcated plateau also portray exceptional stone carvings. It was designed to be more impressive than anything that had existed before it. This is how the original 232 buildings were constructed. However, a few decades following its completion, on the occasion of a mysterious relocation of the seat of the dynasty, Prambanan was abandoned and began to decay. In 1549, an earthquake devastated the buildings. A total of eight temples form the three-level central complex. Staircases, entrance ports and pyramid constructions are also present within the larger main shrines. The larger Kandi Brahma is adjacent to Kandi Siwa and Kandi Vishnu. The whole complex of the central temple is named Rara Jongrang, after a Javanese princess, Bandung Bondowoso, wished to marry her after he had defeated her father in battle. As she had no such plan, she contrived a trick. Bandung had to build a temple with 1,000 statues in a single night. He duly agreed to this and, using his special powers, asked the spirits for their help and created 999 statues. When Rara lit a fire before sunrise, the roosters began to crow as they do at dawn. 
Ban Dong was angry at the deception, and out of rage, he transformed the princess into a statue. And so the entire temple complex took on the name of the cursed beautiful princess. The main Gandhi Shiva temple, located in the center, is the largest and is consecrated to destroyer and innovator, Lord Shiva. Its foundation presents a world of mortals, lust and impurity. The 42 relief scenes around the site depict stories from the Indian epic Ramayana. Cells depict Shiva as teacher, Ganesha his son, Shiva's wife and Shiva himself as a mighty god. The walls around the base of the temple are decorated with artistic reliefs. The reliefs of the Vishnu temple depict scenes of Krishna's youth. Here too there are cells that contain statues of various gods, which receive worshippers in their darkness. In the middle of the 16th century, an earthquake destroyed large sections of the complex, but since 1918, it has been continuously renovated. Near Prambanan, there is Kandi Bubra, another temple which is also being restored. After that follows Kandi Lumbung, a temple complex with several small sanctuaries that frame both a square and temple. The first phase of the restoration between 1937 and 1953 was carried out by the Dutch. Since then, Indonesian archaeologists have successfully worked on the restoration of the site. It is assumed that both Kandi Bubra and Kandi Lumbung are older than Prambanan and are more similar to Kandi Sewu. Mighty guards with clubs continue to guard the area of the Kandi Sewu. The sanctuary testifies to the short heyday of the Buddhist Shailendra dynasty as the largest temple group on Java. Two hundred and forty small shrines in the form of a mandala were once grouped around a main temple. Kandi Sewu is said to be the unfinished temple. It was built in 856 AD by Buddhist king Raikai Pikatan. He married a princess from the Sanjaya dynasty, and so this story forms the historical core of the legend.
The cultural treasure of Prambanan is more than a thousand years old and has been a World Heritage Site since 1991. About 60 kilometers east of Yogyakarta lies Surakarta, formerly known as Solo. The old Sultan courts are considered relics of the past. Above all, it is the symbolism that captivates visitors. The buildings themselves are rather modest. In 1680, the capital of the Islamic Kingdom, Mataram, was relocated here from Kotagedi and became the seat of the Sultan in 1745. The old Sultan's palaces have today been transformed into museums where objects of former courtly life are displayed. Visitors to the palace can enjoy the famous Javanese wooden architecture and each open court pavilion has a special function. The palace district also has a mosque and the octagonal Tower of the Universe, the meeting place of the kings with the goddess of the South Seas. Surakarta has always been a paradise for antique collectors. But beware, there are often many near-perfect reproductions. Only experts can tell if they are counterfeits. The Sultan still resides with his family and 200 servants in the Puro Mangkuni Garan Palace. Only certain rooms are open for visitors, in overshoes or barefoot, and various adjoining rooms still reveal the exquisite atmosphere of times gone by. Today the gardens of the Sultans are freely accessible, strolling among the huge old trees with the surrounding tranquility and the waters splashing in the pools lets the imagination run free. Here, the Sultan, his family and the court spend many relaxing hours. And today there are swimming pools, a buffet and opportunities to go fishing. There is a bird contest taking place in a nearby village. To get there, we have to cross a river in a small ferry boat. The village is now an important meeting place for all bird lovers. They come from all around with their covered cages to register for the competition. Strict judges evaluate the birds that sing in their suspended cages and show off their beauty. The winners receive not just honour, but also prize money. And now, already, it is time to go home. Now we begin a ride on a horse-drawn carriage, which leads us from village to village through the year-round fertile landscape. The traffic here is very relaxed. Apart from us, there are only a few motorcycles and bicycles on the road. The bird owners are also returning home with their most prized possessions. We stop at a house where the whole floor of the yard is covered with rice crackers laid out to dry.
The still wet crackers are laid out next to each other in wooden frames. We then stay to watch how they are produced. Rice mass is cut into thin strips and then deposited, still moist. These strips are spread out in coarse wire nets and dipped in hot fat several times. This process is repeated over the course of the day in the dark and extremely hot bakery. And the delicious rice crackers are ready, which are sold like hotcakes in Surakarta. We drive on and are overtaken again and again by the nimble drivers delivering the fresh crackers. Speed is everything. Volcanic ash makes the soil here very fertile, meaning it is suited to intensive agriculture. Rice is cultivated all around here and the villagers share the production of three harvests per year. People here are hard-working and content and keep their houses and streets clean. Now we will see how Georgia beans are cooked, peeled and finally wrapped as small packages in big leaves to be sold. The carriage ride continues through a village that looks particularly uninhabited during the day as the farmers are at work in the fields. We drive to their fields, which are right beside the village. Rice fields, as far as the eye can see. Well irrigated and almost always ready for harvest. As with everywhere in Southeast Asia, rice is the staple food here and the base for many dishes. The harvests are good and the land can sustain itself. A blessing that no longer exists everywhere. The volcanoes of central Java have certainly made the area more prosperous. Surakarta train station takes us back to the present day. From here we begin a diverse train ride in the mountain air of Malang. A train ride along the volcanoes of Java. Where in the past people used to have a hard time getting around on bad roads with ox carts, today they can use a comfortable track. To begin with, the ride leads past endless green rice paddy fields. Again and again, the train stops. Longer at larger stations, and only for a short time at rural stations. The train drivers change from station to station. The train timetable is strictly stuck to and there are no delays at any of the stations, which is a nice side effect. The volcano Gunung Kukusan accompanies us along the first part of the journey. 
at the moment not quite visible, as the clouds gather around a height of almost 2,300 metres. But it is there, even if well camouflaged. The railway junction Keta Sona sits at 43 metres above sea level. From here, the track continues either to Surabaya to the sea or further along the volcanoes up to Malang. Slowly, the train rolls off again, leaving the big train station punctually. We take the track to Malang. To the right, there are more volcanoes. And small villages in the middle of the fertile landscape. We pass more and more small stations, although the train does not stop, naturally to be able to keep to the schedule. We have already reached Blitar. Suddenly, the weather changes, and it becomes clear why everything grows so well here. There are paddy fields wherever you look, and in the background, the mighty volcano Gunung Butak, with an altitude of 2,868 meters, now on our left side. The so-called wet rice cultivation caused large waves of settlement here, with the farmers recognizing rice cultivation as the most important task. The various fields are worked alternately to ensure several harvests a year. We leave Kepanjen. Now the stops are getting shorter and shorter as we leave the lowlands behind us. Soon we will reach our destination, the economic center of the province East Java. The station is very busy. After all, Malang has always been a popular place in the mountains. Malang was once the centre of power and culture in Indonesia, and it still captivates visitors today with its colonial charm. After the era of the Singasari dynasty, a Dutch mountain station was built here, and tobacco and coffee brought wealth to the area. Malang has become a major city in the mountains, with mighty palm tree avenues, mansions and rush hour traffic. In the central square, Medan Merdeka, the Dutch built the Protestant Gereja Emmanuel Church in a new Gothic style. Just next door is the main mosque, Mesjid Jami, the Great Mosque, which is also a symbol of the harmonious coexistence of religions in the tolerant city. The main square is a park where the residents meet at all hours. By day, mainly the children, and later on, the adults. This is a place of rest and relaxation in the midst of hectic traffic 
which almost makes you forget the nearby mountains. Even an old Dutch bakery has survived and allows a glimpse into the former days of luxury. After mass, people would meet here for coffee and cake. A comfort, just like in old Europe. A special attraction is the bird market near the river, with many different species. Here too, birds are part of everyday life and are considered popular domestic animals. And the neighbouring flower market, whose luxuriant splendour could send every plant lover into a shopping frenzy. The Engangkyung Temple is a symbol for Malang's Chinese population. With Buddhist, Taoist and Confucian altars. Sacred fountains, well-kept courtyards, swinging roofs, mystical godly figures, columns and dragons create a mystical atmosphere. And the smell of incense sticks stimulates the worshippers' senses. But Kampung Wanawari is indisputably the tourist attraction of the moment. With its diagonally colourfully painted collection of small cabins on both banks of the Brantas River, this is a place to which every visitor to the city is drawn. Like a miracle, university students in an experiment have been able to turn the slum settlement in this gorge into an attraction for visitors. Now, the renovated buildings shine. The jeep ride to the Bromo Tenga Semeru National Park begins in the village of Ngadas through the landscape up into the volcanic mountains. The roads are narrow and often lead along mountain ridges, but the trees grow so densely that you can rarely see the view. We have reached the first stop, the Koban Peland waterfall. A hiking trail leads down into a ravine where, at least for now, the lush vegetation blocks any view. An almost impenetrable jungle on the slopes of the canyon, where the humid air contributes to the daily unrelenting growth of the plants. The path leads us further downwards, till the waterfall. From 30 metres high, the water falls from an overhanging cliff down into a small basin before the river continues on. Now we pass the entrance to the Bromo Tenga Semeru National Park. Finally, the morning sun slowly soaks up the fog and the view is cleared. We are driving along a thin crest with steep drops either side. Suddenly, we reach the first viewpoint, Posco Terpadu. In front of us, the huge Tenga caldera opens up and the first volcanic cones rise up before us. On the descent into the caldera, vegetation becomes less and less frequent and the plants that we do see change too. We have to cross this crater before we reach our next overnight stop. 
Here, at over 2,000 meters, the ground is covered with fine volcanic sand. The Tenga people live here, a small tribe living in the mountain villages, the descendants of part of the Majapahit dynasty. But the highlight of the trip is still to come the next morning. We have all made it to a vantage point for the approaching sunrise. We huddle here in the cold, waiting for the magical moment. An almost supernatural play of colours on the horizon, and the contours of the surrounding landscape come slowly into view. There was no clue in the dark of night, but now the volcanoes emerge before us. Down below is the Sea of Sand of the Caldera, which is intersected by a river. Finally, the big moment. The sun appears on the horizon. The day breaks and the patient tourists are rewarded at last. This is how you imagine paradise to be. Mystical atmosphere, breathtaking light and the landscape of a strange, unknown planet. And the Bromo volcano smokes as usual, resembling a home for gods and demons. The wind is still blowing up here, but in the sun it doesn't seem so cold anymore, and now, at least, we know where we are. In the northern part of Java is the thriving town of Surabaya and its harbour. For the Dutch colonial masters, the harbour became a main trading hub of the Dutch East Indies early on. The main city of East Java is located on the Java Sea, a part of the Australasian Mediterranean, on the edge of the Pacific Ocean. Today, the seaport Surabaya is a centre of trade and industry. In the traditional river port Kalimas, the Indonesia of old lives on. Wooden Makassar schooners bring and collect goods of all kinds. The huge sailing ships seem imposing, and boogies work here side by side with Javanese and Manduracen. The Arab Quarter is an old neighbourhood full of mosques, markets and colonial buildings with a unique atmosphere. Also here is the big mosque with the holy grave of Sunan Ampel, the founder of the city. You can visit the Sampoana cigarette factory. This is where the famous clove cigarettes were invented. The lovingly assembled museum documents the success story of the largest cigarette empire and its production. Music 
It smells fragrant everywhere here. Tourists are rather rare in the hot and humid city and are hardly noticeable when driving through the market lanes. It's busy here too, and eager trading is part of everyday life. The congested red bridge spans the Kalimas River. And just afterwards, the lively Chinatown district fans out before us, which is still the spiritual heart of the city today. Along the narrow streets are small houses, with shops downstairs, and the owners' living rooms above. In 1919, the Hotel Orange opened as the first in the city. Now it is called Hotel Majapahit. You can understand why Dutch plantation owners, senior officers, ship owners and wealthy merchants frequented this palace-like setting. Here, colonial flair can be guaranteed with well-kept gardens, colonnades, and traditional equipment. The incredible luxury of a time whose success was based solely on the strength of colonial power. A luxury that can hardly be beaten even today. The Noble Hotel was founded by the Sarkis brothers, who also owned Raffles in Singapore and the Strand in Rangoon. The hero monument, Tugu Palawan, commemorates the fallen fighters during the Battle of Surabaya against British Indian troops. Militarily a defeat, but morally a victory. The path along the Kalimas leads to the Marine Museum. In here, you can visit an Indonesian Navy submarine. And the well-kept promenade along the riverbank invites you to linger a while. In the evening, the river, bridges and streets look like a dream of dancing lights. You cannot leave Indonesia without seeing and learning about batik. An ancient tradition of textile dyeing with characteristic motifs and colours. The batik artist uses a small copper pot to apply liquid wax to the image drawn onto the fabric. This method ensures that when colouring the material with a first colour, that this colour does not hold in these places. So these drawn sections remain empty. After repeating this procedure for other colours, a picture gradually emerges. A batik work of art. The range of ornaments and motifs used today goes far beyond the original religious motifs.
and batik images and fabrics specially made for tourists are popular souvenirs. Java is an island where extreme contrasts in a small amount of space combine to create an exciting symbiosis. Traditional culture competes with modern ways of life. Villages and volcanoes alternate with monuments. A land of millennia-old civilization has opened itself up to the world. <laughs>